Hello, everyone, and sorry this video lecture is a little bit late. I found an error in it this afternoon, and I decided to redo it. So first of all, note that I am not doing it right when I wake up in the morning, so I am positively chipper. And we will dive into this material with an enthusiastic Murph. So the first thing I want to talk about is something called the gambler's fallacy, which is something that I actually think is so cool. Although maybe I just think it's cool because it has kind of a schnazzy and dramatic name and frankly, usually that's enough for me to like something. So the gambler's fallacy, it is the erroneous claim that past outcomes of a random variable affect future outcomes. And I have an example. So the gambler's fallacy, it, it, it comes up whenever you think of somebody making bets at a casino. And they know, hmm, okay, so I have like a 10% chance of winning this game. And I keep losing and I keep losing and I keep losing. And I keep, and I've lost like a hundred times. But I decide to keep going because I know the probability is 10%. I should keep going because that win is coming up. And we'll see why that is kind of not a great strategy. In fact, it is one of the reasons casinos make so much money and often gamblers lose. So, example a certain skier. can go down black diamonds in Sun Valley, Idaho without wiping out Eighty percent of the time. Today, he's gone down twenty percent. Oh, excuse me, not twenty percent, twenty black diamonds. not wiped out once. What's the probability that he'll wipe out on the next black diamond? And the answer, as I hope you all intuitively get from my definition of the gambler's fallacy, is 80%. The fact that previous events did not result in a success should bear no effect on future draws of the success. So this individual should, you know, he shouldn't say, ooh, I'm not going to try my luck and keep going down because I know this next one is going to be a wipeout. Well, this next one, he has the same chance of wiping out as he did for any of the other 20 black diamonds he went down. So this is a concept that may come up in your problems, but mostly I hope it comes up in your life if you ever decide to go to a casino and think about whether or not you should stop. <laughs> All right, so that's the gambler's fallacy. Next, we're going to talk a little bit more about the fourth law of probability, or actually the third, excuse me. So I'll just go ahead and write it down. It was if events A and B 
are disjoint. Then the probability of A or the probability of the probability of A or B is equal to the probability of A plus the probability of B. And I have an example that should hopefully get us to think a little bit more about this law. So consider this. So this is our deck of cards. I believe we've spoken about this already. There are 52 cards in a deck and they can be one of four suits or one of 13 different, I guess, values. So consider our deck of cards and consider the following two events. Event A, which I will say is card drawn as a diamond. Or event B, which is card drawn as a face card. Which face cards are jack, queens, or kings? So that's actually referring to this little subpopulation right here in our deck. Okay. <clears throat> so if I wanted to know the probability of A, I know that there are 52 cards total in the deck. I have a sample space of 52. If I'm just drawing one card, drawing one card, what's the probability that the card drawn is a diamond? And of this sample space, it looks like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13 of them are diamonds, right? So it's 13 out of 52, which did I simplify that to 1 fourth? I did. Okay. So that's probability of A, let's look at probability of B. This is the probability that we get a face card, right? So that it's everything in this square that I drew. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. So 12 of the possible 52 cards are face cards. So assuming that every single card has an equal likely chance of being picked, this is our probability, which is approximately 0. 0.8. Two, three, zero, eight. Okay. So my next question for you is what is the probability of A or B? What is the probability that I pick a card that belongs into that belongs in either of these categories? And I want you to know is that it isn't probability of A plus probability of B. I'll show you why that is. So let's look at let's look at what the probability of A or B is. Okay, so let's go up to our deck. Let's zoom in a little bit here, and let's just count up the cards that belong in either of the groups. So maybe I'll even use a different color. So these are all the diamonds: one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. Then I also need all the face cards. So I got 13 and then 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 21, 22, 23. Did I write 3, 6, 9, 12, 22. I think I counted wrong. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 22. My bad. Oh my goodness, I counted wrong the first time. So there are 22 different cards that belong in either of the categories. A or B refers to 22 cards. Therefore, the probability of A or B is 22 out of 52. In contrast, probability of A plus the probability of B equals, well, what did we say the probability of A was? It was 1 fourth or 13 out of 25 out of 52, excuse me, plus 12 out of 52 which is 25 out of 52? No, these numbers are not the same. Right? So I've just proven to you that probability of A or B is not equal to the probability of A plus the probability of B. And the reason this is, is because they are not disjoint. Right? This law of probability, law three, requires that the events are disjoint but in fact, these events are not disjoint specifically for the reason 
that there do exist cards that belong in both categories. There are cards that are both red, both diamonds, and face cards. So we can't use this trick of adding up the probabilities in the or situation unless we have disjointness. So this is because. are not destroyed. Okay. When dealing with problems like this, so when you want to think about, hmm, are these events disjoint or not disjoint? What probability should I be adding together? What probability shouldn't I be adding together? It is helpful to use a Venn diagram. That's the next topic. OK. So I'm going to start by drawing our Venn diagram, I think, for this problem. OK. Circle here. There. So this is a Venn diagram. It is a visualization of our different events in our sample space. So the whole box is the sample space here. So this whole box refers to every possible outcome, every single card in the deck that we could choose. This circle right here refers to everything in event A, which is what all diamonds. This thing right here is, you know, I'll use a different color. This thing right here is everything in event B, which are all face cards. And then the thing in the middle is everything in, that belongs in both, in A and B, which are all diamond face cards. So a Venn diagram is a way to visualize the relationship between different events, whether they intersect, whether they don't, right? The whole box is every single possible thing that could happen. It's our sample space. And the circles that we make in a Venn diagram refer to events that can happen within the sample space. Note, these don't need to be in scale. Like my, my A isn't necessarily to scale of the proportion of values that should be in A. It's just kind of a visualization to talk about relationships between events. So whenever you draw a Venn diagram, I want you to fill it in a certain way. And I'm going to show you how to do that now for our example. Okay. So this is A, the event of all the diamonds, and B, the event of all the face cards. What I want you to do is in here, put the proportion of just diamonds. 
When I mean by just diamonds, I mean things that are just diamonds and not both. So this is all the diamonds that aren't also a face card. And this, is, this, this will help you with your calculations. So in here, I want everything that's a diamond but not a face card. So what, what is that? Um, that would be these values right here, everything that's a diamond but not a face card. So that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay. So in A right here, I would put 10 out of 52. Okay. And then I want to do the same thing for B, and I'm just gonna go ahead and tell you I want everything that's a face card but not a diamond. So all the face cards that aren't diamond, and there are actually nine of those. So this is just I should do it like this. Proportion of just face cards. And then here, I want you to put proportion of both. So how many are both diamonds and face cards? Well, that's pretty easy. It's everything in the red here, these three. So three out of 52. And if you would like, on the outside, so in the space in neither of these circles, put proportion of cards not in either. OK? So if we look back at our deck, that's going to be all of these cards are in neither of our categories and all of these cards. So that's 10, 20, 30. So the proportion not in either, the proportion that goes here is 30 out of 52. Okay? And the reason we do this is because now if I ask a question like what is the probability of A or B, I would say, well, this is the probability of just A plus the probability of just B plus the probability of A and B, okay? Which is, you can think about it in terms of area actually. It's kind of this area, this is just A, this area, this is just B plus this area, which is both. And if I add those three areas together, I get everything that's in the intersection of the two circles without, um, without double counting is the idea. So without, without, excuse me, maybe I should explain that more. You get everything that's the area of these three circles without double counting the middle area here. Because if I just added the area of the two circles, I would add that center area twice, which you shouldn't be doing. So now that I've written this out, the probability of A or B is actually just 10 out of 52, probability of just A, plus 9 out of 52, the probability of just B, plus the probability of A and B, which is 3 out of 52, which is 22 out of 52, which is the correct answer. If you remember uh, way back here, we actually did this calculation ourselves. The probability was indeed 22 out of 52. So if you are presented with a place where you're not really sure if things are disjoint, draw out your Venn diagram. Do it completely. And then once you've done so, thinking about probability calculations, it's just a matter of reading things off from the table. So what if I wanted to say probability of A or B, but not both? Well, it's easy. I just take the probability here plus the probability of here, and I don't in the, add in the both. So this one would just be 10 out of 52 plus 9 out of 52, or 19 out of 52, right? Then diagrams just sort of make these sort of make these calculations easier. So that is Venn diagrams. I want to end by just writing some useful facts.
about expected value and variance. So this, if you haven't looked at the live lecture, or if you weren't at the live lecture, I would suggest to do that now because this uses something that we spoke about in class today, not covered so far in this particular video lecture. But I introduced these two calculations for something called a random variable, which were the expected value of the random variable, which we denote e of x, and the variance of the random variable, which we denote x. So I have some facts about these two things that I encourage you to use in your upcoming homework or you know, in your life. <laughs> so if a and b are constants, and x and y are random variables, the following formula are true. And that is, I'm just going to list them out. The expected value of a constant times a random variable is just equal to that constant times the expected value of the, of the random variable. So you can pull the constant out of an expectation is the idea. The expectation of the sum of random variables, so if I had two outcomes, rolling a die maybe, and, and um, <laughs> rolling a six-sided die and rolling a 20-sided die, the expected value of their sum is equal to the expected value of, what, of rolling the six-sided die plus the expected value of rolling the 20-sided die. So the expected value of a sum is equal to the sum of the expectations. That's a property called linearity, actually, but you don't need to know that. And similarly, if you actually combine these two, expected value of ax plus by is equal to a e of x plus b, e of y. So these are our little idea, um, sort of identities or facts I'm going to give you about the thing expected value, which we covered today in class. I'm also going to give you some things about variance. So the variance of ax, so a constant times x, is equal to that constant squared times the variance of x. Cool. So you can also pull a constant. Out of, a random uh, out of a variance calculation, but you have to square it when you do so. And the variance of x plus a, where remember a is a constant, is just equal to the variance of x. So adding a constant to a random variable in a variance calculation has no effect. The following fact I give you, you need to have that x and y are independent, which is another thing we spoke about in class today. When these two random variables are independent, so think flipping a coin versus the weather tomorrow, when they're independent, the variance of x plus y is equal to the variance of x plus the variance of y. So I can do the same thing with the expectation that I did with the expectation, sort of like do it to each of them rather than do it to their sum. I can do the same thing with variance, but only if they're independent. So if they're not independent, this is not true. So if you want to use this last little identity I've given you, make sure that the random variables are independent before you do it. OK? So I believe that is everything I wanted to cover. Let me make doubly sure. Mm -hmm. Yep, that's it. Thank you for waiting. I'm sorry this video lecture was delayed, and I will see you all tomorrow.